the Fafund is second quartile in the venture world, but otherwise outperforming other asset classes, then yeah, like that could be interesting. If a group is second quartile, but they're delivering second quartile returns, while well, say deploying, you know, a billion plus a year, then that is interesting. Do you think the incentives for pension funds in the United States are inefficient? Peter, I've been really excited, really looking forward to the chat. Uh, welcome to 10X Capital Podcast. Yeah, no, thanks for, thanks for having me, David. Peter, when you were at TMRS, you deployed roughly a billion dollars across managers. Break that down for me. Yeah. So that billion dollars, uh, you know, that was or that, that, that was specifically in the venture capital category. Um, you know, the, the, the total amount I ended up working on there um, actually actually ended up being over uh, five billion in, in commitments. Um, that billion was split between seven managers, um, a mix of what's called like you know more software focus groups to biotech from early stage to later stage, um, end up being diversified across the the, uh, the the spectrum of strategies and sectors. Um, but that's that's not necessarily how I went about um, building it. I, I didn't have diversification as the top line goal of of this portfolio. Um, I mean, venture venture is a game of uh, alpha generation. It's a game of uh, capturing you know ca capturing and getting exposure, being a part of um, you know these these outliers' journeys. And diversification uh, is kind of at odds. Um, <clears throat> it's, it's kind of at odds with that. So I mean, really, really for me in building that portfolio and filling it out with with those seven managers what i was really keying on was um was backing or was looking for and backing artists what, what do you mean by that artist i might use artist and force of nature interchangeably but um when, when, when i talk about creativity and conviction i'm talking about people um, i'm talking about investors that are able you know that, that are willing to do things differently from the pack um, you know, group, you know, investors are actually, you know, willing to take risks that aren't, aren't necessarily just, um, looking to, you know, get into the hottest round led by, led by Sequoia or, or, or led by benchmark, uh, you know, people, you know, these are people with like actual differentiated views on, you know, on, on the world and, and how to build their firms. You mentioned seven managers for roughly a billion dollars. How did you go about building that book? We had to find managers that were, um, you know, that, 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 that had the potential to, substantially outperform uh, the managers in those other parts of the books. From there, though, it, it became a task of boiling the ocean, turning over as many stones um, as, as, as I could to find, uh, you know, to, to find those seven um, during the time at TMRS. The, the total um, plan was over over $30 billion. Um, because of that, I mean, the, the tail does end up wagging the dog in some cases here, but you do have to find opportunities where where or we, we had to find opportunities where we could put substantial amounts of capital to work. Um, we had to, we, we had to find opportunities where we, where, where we could put, um, where we could make $50 million in upsize commitments, um, to these groups. How did you sequence that? How do you practically build a billion dollar venture book? I, I called it a hub and spoke approach. Um, the, the, the very first commitment, um, of, you know, of, of that process of this program was, um, it, it was, it was to a group, well, it was to Foundry. Um, it was doubling down on their, on their fund to fund work. We, we created a custom fund with them that, um, I mean, the, the initial commitment was hundred million. It was just going to co-invest alongside them. We were able to write a very large check to, you know, tow our way into the venture world with a strategy that, um, you know, with, with this, with this fund to fund strategy that, um, was inherently de-risked, um, and. It also had these up, you know, these these upside nodes to it, where we could, um, where over time the relationships that we were, you know, indirectly backing could become direct relationships of of ours. That boundary fund that we created with them was that to me it was it was fee advantage. There was a less, um, I mean, we we, we were able to negotiate uh, the fees, and there was much less fee drag involved there than with say just going to you know going to X Y Z fund of funds and committing to their blind pool vehicle. Um, in this case, we had a good idea of what was going, you know, what was likely going to be in this fund. And we also knew that there wasn't going to be a management fee um, on, on it too, reducing the fee drag up front. So you invested into their fund of funds with management fees and carry, and then you invested as a co-investor without management fees. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah. So, so we we're, we're already in Foundry's main fund. Um, we then went to them with this idea and created this separate, this separate vehicle, the separate fund that co-invested into, it co-invested alongside Foundry into um, the venture funds where they had excess allocation. Um, 
in that in that custom that that new customized fund would um, didn't have a management fees. But there was an underlying management fee and carry. They were just on the incremental vehicle. Yeah. There was only carry. Yeah, correct. But f f from an investment standpoint, from a portfolio construction, from a governance standpoint, what mistakes did you make on that venture book? I, I almost found like I, I found myself falling into the trap of filling, you know, of, of wanting to fill this venture bucket and, you know, ultimately filling this private equity bucket that we had. But so uh, most institutional LPs, um, you know, they, they have these strategic asset allocations and like they, they pacing models that show like, okay, how much do I need to commit in order, you know, annually in order to meet that target or maintain that target um, or, or v v vice, vice versa. Um, and in the case of, in the case of TMRS, our, our PE allocation had been doubled or the target had been doubled from five to 10% um, around the time we started making these commitments. And so I, I, this, I, I felt this inherent pressure to increase the, uh, you know, to, to, to increase the, uh, the, the check sizes, to put more, more money out more quickly. I had Joshua Berkowitz on the podcast uh, from a family office. And he said that it's very important to think about the pacing model in terms of how do you make sure that you deploy across every single year uh, so that you're able to recycle the capital uh, you know, in year seven, year eight, yeah. or, or however, and his model is he invests roughly a sixth over six years. How do you look at institutional pacing models in venture for an institutional LP? We, we look at the growth assumptions of like, of, of what we already have under management. I mean, we look at, we make assumptions around again, like, you know, how much capital is going to be called down um, over time, how much capital is going to be distributed. But in, you know, in, in, in this case, and this, th th this gets back to the, the tail wagging the dog, um, there, there is a pressure to reach you know, to, to reach these target allocations that are set in, in a timely manner. The, the most important thing um, in, in these pacing models is to just like, is, is to actually, you know, be able to have exposure to multiple vintage years. So you're not overexposed to, uh, to just one single vintage or like, you know, avo avoiding just being exposed to 2021 venture, for instance. Absolutely. What is the biggest lesson you learned at T TMRS, Texas Municipal Retirement Systems? Making sure the organization is aligned in its goals and how to achieve those goals. I mean, what, what that looks like for an LP really is just that you, I mean, is, is that the investment team, um, the investment team and the non-investment teams within these, you know, within these organizations and the board of trustees as well, that, that they all, that, that they all trust what each other is doing, that the investment team has delegated investment authority, but that the investment team is, is also keeping the rest of the, the organization, the rest of the stakeholders apprised of how, you know, of, of what's going on. Um, again, it's, it's governance, it's, it's alignment, it's, it's trust. You mentioned that you managed $5 billion at TMRS. Where were the other $4 billion invested? That was going into other private equity and private equity oriented type of strategies. So buy, buyouts, growth equity, um, special situations, which was a catch all for, group, for, 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 for strategies for managers that didn't quite fit the private equity bucket neatly. Well, let's talk about governance. We talked about our, our friend at State of Wisconsin Investment Board. If they got the governance right and that they trust their investment staff. We just saw uh, recently uh, the investment to Bitcoin and crypto as an example. Uh, tell me about governance and how that leads to returns for LPs. There's all sorts of governance models that you could say, like range from, again, like, you know, delegation, you know, delegation forward to being, you know, to on the other end, like no delegation. Um, Partner, you know, working more with fund of funds and relying more on consultants. That governance, uh, you know, and you know, of, of these more forward-thinking groups, it again, like it, it relies heavily on on delegation. That is, the investment team being able to being able to invest the way you know the, the way that they want to, the way that they see fit, and to do so um, again, like with, with with the trust of 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 the rest of the organization. I mean, what that what that looks like in practice is that. Um, you know, typically, typically it comes down to like a matter of size with, you know, with, with investments, as long as, as long as the potential investment recommendation is below, say, a certain percentage of the total fund, then the investment team has full discretion. Um, again, that delegated investment authority to, uh, you know, to, to invest it how they, how they see fit. Um, not every, not every LP is like that. Um, I mean, you, you'll, you'll have some firms or some organizations um, that have to take every one of their investments, uh, you know, to a board of trustees for approval, or they might, you know, they, they might need sign off from a consultant, um, or, or, or they may just rely on a fund of funds to make all their, all their investments for them. I mean, those are all examples of, um, where, where, where there isn't delegated investment authority, where the governance model, um, isn't, isn't really built on, on trust. We were talking offline about the incentives for LP consultants, how there's misalignment between principal and agent. Tell me about the incentives for LP consultants. Consultants. I mean, they're, I mean, they're, 
they're, they're typically paid on on a retainer on a you know an, an annual or multi-year contract of of some sort. I, I haven't heard of consultants being paid with uh, um, incentive comp um, or, or carry or some you know so, so, so again like some some form of uh, incentive to uh, you know to drive high upside type outcomes. Um, the incentives are instead again like you know not to not to get fired to keep the contract um, going and. <clears throat> I mean, again, like that's like, like that, that that's, that's an inherent misalignment. Um, I mean, it's, it, 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 it illustrates just like that it illustrates again, like the principal agent problem, the goal is to continue the contract to not get fired. They'll lead consultants, um, you know, usually recommending like, you know, groups that aren't emerging managers going to these more snapshot options after, um, after the alpha has really been generated. Um, so again, like it's, yeah, like it, it, it's, it's one of those reasons why emerging managers have a, um, you know, have a, a more difficult time raising than established firms uh, with long multi-fund historical track records. They're, I mean, they're, they're, they're right in the crosshairs of a principal agent problem that, um, that, that they may not even know about. You oftentimes hear venture capital is an access class. Are there LPs that are self-aware that are continuing to invest in the asset class that know that they're getting exposure to second quartile or even third quartile funds? There have to be. Yeah, there, there's only there's only so much capacity available for LPs that you're going to have to you're going to have to find other you know other areas of the world uh, you know uh, other other groups to uh, you know to commit your capital to. Um, if again, like if you want to be in venture, like you're, like you're going to get naturally pushed to uh, you know to groups that may have historically underperformed. I mean, yeah, like the quantitative story may show that this group has historically underperformed, but under the hood, there might be, there might be green shoots. There might be some sort of, um, th th there, you know, yeah, there, there, there might be a new strategy or a new team, you know, coming forth from, you know, fr from this historically underperforming firm that makes it actually makes it interesting to, uh, you know, to, uh, to, to back. Is there a rational reason for LPs that can't access top quartile to invest in second quartile or median performing venture funds? Is there financial rationale for that? Or is it purely just to check the box and make, make their uh, ICs happy? If a fund is second quartile in the venture world, but outperforming, um, you know, otherwise outperforming other asset classes, then yeah, like that, that, that could be interesting. Um, if a group is second quartile, but they're doing, but, but they're delivering second, uh, second quartile returns while, while say deploying, you know, a billion plus a year, then that's like, that, 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 that is, that is interesting. I went to my, my mentor who was setting up a billion dollar single family office and he asked me what he should do. And I said, you should go to all the top funds and side letter hire carry. What do you think about that? That's one way to get access. Um, have you ever seen that? I no, no, I've, I've, I've never, I've never seen that. Um, a public institution could, could never like they, they, they could never do that. The, yeah. Like the, the investment team would get, would get raked over the coals. Um, I mean, in, 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 but it's one way to get immediate access day one. I, I imagine most, most investors, most GPs would, would take that offer. Speaking of incentives for pension funds, do you think the incentives for pension funds in the United States are inefficient? Yes. Um, many public funds, um, you know, don't incentivize their investment team. I mean, the, the, the team itself, the teams in these cases, they care about not getting fired, but there's no incentive to like take a risk, walk, you know, walk to the edge and find, turn over the stones and find an interesting opportunity as a higher likelihood of underperforming than, you know, a $10 billion uh, buyout fund, but could deliver, you know, multiples upon multiples upon multiples of, you know, better, uh, better return. I think the Canadian pension funds are much closer to, seems to be principal agent alignment and the way that they do it is they pay seven figure uh, yeah. salaries to the very best in class and the top people. And those people typically would have gone on the GP side, they, they go on the LP side. And there's a lot of research and a lot of evidence that that system is, is working really well for the Canadians. Yeah. If you were running a pension fund, let's say you were CIO, how would you go about attracting and retaining top talent? Well, I mean, you, you, you hit on it. Uh, you, you just hit on it. Um, you know, it's following, you know, whether, you know, that Canadian model or the, or, or, or the Sing Singapore, uh, you know, public sector model. If you want to build a strong, cohesive team that isn't going to be constantly worried about jumping or constantly worried about their own compensation growth or their own skill set growth, then you just have to pay them um, and compensate them really, you know, really well. We'll get right back to the interview, but first to stay updated on all things emerging managers and limited partners, including the very latest data on venture returns and insights on how to raise capital from limited partners, subscribe to our free newsletter at 10xcapitalpodcast.com. That's www.10xcapitalpodcast.com. If you could change one thing about the investment management industry, what would that one thing be? It would be a step towards solving that alignment issue. Um, it's 
delegate, like giving the investment teams at every one of these organizations, the, the delegation, the authority, the discretion to do their jobs, to invest. You know, there, there's all sorts of strings attached, you know, to, you know, to, to, to delegation, you know, to these governance models and, you know, just, just being able to put the trust back in place with the investment team, you know, to allow them to invest without, you know, w without interference from all sorts of other um, stakeholders, I, th I think would go a long way towards, um, you know, t towards, um, you know, delivering great financial outcomes to making, you know, to making staff feel more empowered to reducing the, the that revolving door that we're talking about, um, even. But again, it, it comes down to trust. It comes down to it, it comes down to uh, people, you know, people trusting the investment team and the investment team trusting each other. We were speaking offline about LP GP relationships. What is the best way for LPs and GPs to build a relationship with each other? It just comes down to uh, it, it. Just comes down to time. We all went through COVID years. I mean, I mean, we we, we all committed to groups where you know we you know we're, we spent more time with them, um, you know, over over Zoom or over the phone versus in in person. But again, that 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 in person time is is, is just so important to uh, you know to to getting to know um, to, to getting to know these people to really like to, to really start building the mosaic. That is, you know, the, the, the that is your investment thesis for like why why you're going to partner with them for for, for years to come. B building real relationships, um, for, first and foremost. Peter, it's been a fascinating interview. I've learned a lot, and I know the audience has as well. What would you like uh, to shine a light on for the audience? I spent most of my career uh, um, on, on on the private investing side. Um, again, but mostly as an LP, um, of, of course, as we've as, as, as we've touched on today. Um, and during that, you know, during that experience, you know, th th through that five billion or so of uh, you know of 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 commitments that, that that I've been able to make, I've, I've come to realize again it's, it's important to look for look for these investors that are playing at the intersection of creativity and conviction. It's important to look for these investors that that are artists who. You know who, who treat their work with this duty and this feeling of care absolutely well it's been really great to chat peter i uh, look forward to meeting uh, i'm in austin often so look forward to sitting down there or in new york city yeah absolutely thanks peter thanks david for more ideas on how to raise venture capital in this market make sure to subscribe below 